Well, brother, it is Mental Health Awareness Month. And one of the things that we're doing is just as a family, just trying to say, okay, how do we lean in? How do we understand more? How do we step in more? And so uh, we have a good friend here, uh, Joey Bickley, and he's just said, hey, I'm, I'm okay saying, hey, me too. And this is my story. And so today we're just going to lean into a little bit of your story, which is uh, talking through chronic illness and all that comes with that. So why don't you just catch us up on your story and where you are and, and uh, where you found yourself. Great. Thanks, Matt. You know, a few years ago, I caught myself along the journey uh, as a man. Uh, you know, it's nothing out of pride, but sometimes it can be just that lack of, you know, that fear of uh, just being vulnerable. And, um, you know, sometimes it can be very exhausting just to have the mask on and pretending that everything's okay when deep down we know it's not. And so after, you know, a couple of decades of always saying, hey, things are fine. Um, how's your day? It's good. Um, you know, just kind of felt like I was living um, not a true, true nature to myself. I just kind of had that epiphany to, to be vulnerable and to just finally sharing some of that that was close to me. And in that journey, you know, a lot of folks, you know, would come up after too and, hey, I felt the same way, you know. And so different seasons, different walks of life, uh, that's kind of the crazy thing with uh, chronic illness. Uh, you just never know when things are going to rear its head. Yeah. So walk us through, what, if you don't mind sharing, just okay. what is your chronic illness? And when did, when did it hit? And, and what's, what's a little bit of that journey look like? Yeah. I, I try to go because uh, I was recently, uh, a few years ago, able to get uh, a diagnosis. Uh, but looking back, you know, we don't know, we don't know. So I was symptomatic of certain things at an early age, uh, whether it's on a road trip at age seven and falling asleep in the car as soon as I'm, I'm buckled in. Uh, and that seemed to always be the norm. Uh, we would laugh about it as a family and, and not know any different. Uh, then, you know, through college, um, Somehow all my classes were at 8 a.m., you know, for my economics and uh, business major. And, you know, but my roommate would, would hate the fact that I'd set three different alarm clocks at different parts of the room uh, because I would, what I now know is sleep inertia. It's the equivalent of, if anybody's ever had uh, surgery, it's like waking up out of anesthesia. You have that grogginess, you're not aware, um, you have autonomic behavior that you really can't recall. And so, that becomes problematic when you need to get to class and you've turned off inadvertently uh, uh, different alarm clocks or overslept. Uh, so, but my official diagnosis is idiopathic hypersomnia. So it's a Greek fancy term for cause unknown of excessive sleepiness. Uh, so it's really a diagnosis of undiagnosis, mm. uh, if that makes sense. But yeah, well, what's interesting is so many people who are in chronic illness, they feel the same way. You know, whether some of them know exactly what it is, but some of them, it's part of it is the life of not knowing really what yeah. it is, but feeling its impact. So yeah, keep going. And so that's the one of the the criteria for a diagnosis. It's kind of a two pronged approach. Is they in essence have to exclude and. Um, pretty much disqualified about 150 other medical conditions, um, which that in itself is very, very trying. Uh, in our healthcare system, it's a lot of fragmentation. And so visiting specialist to specialist, you know, here locally uh, in other parts of the country uh, becomes very expensive, uh, becomes very time consuming uh, and creates a lot of uncertainty. So that's kind of the first part. And then once you kind of get through that, um, I've had about 10 different nighttime and daytime sleep studies. So, uh, data is one thing it's, can you take action on? It's another. And so with that, they've kind of boards, um, you know, neurologists, sleep specialists got together, say, Hey, we have these outlier patients that we don't know what to do with. What's some criteria that we can clinically put down on paper to give an official diagnosis. And so once you satisfy that, so that's how I got my official diagnosis. Um, but like I said, it's when you have that diagnosis of, of unknown, um, there's still a lot of things we have to revisit, like say with my genetics doctor, things we ruled out four years ago. Well, now there's a greater understanding of some different neural pathways. We have to revisit that. So while that's exciting and, 
brings optimism and hope. There's also that um, exhaustion of we have to go down this path again, but it's all part of the journey. Yeah, well, even as I hear you say that, right, I'm, I, it's exhaustion, but it's not just physical exhaustion, it's emotional exhaustion, right? And right. so, because, uh, you know, here you are, you get, in regardless of, uh, you know, I think it hits people differently. It's like sometimes you just want to know what it is so you can deal with it. And then you find out what it is and then you recognize, oh, there's no silver bullet. This is just the way it is, you know, until maybe Jesus comes back. Yeah. And then sometimes you're just left in the forever of undiagnosed. But then it kind of, uh, usually for a lot of people, and I'd just love to hear for you, then it starts ticking some other boxes. It's not just what you're challenged with. It's the emotions. It's your, then it's your, um, you know, mental health around just anxiety popping up, depression. Is it, you know, is this, now you're left with the wake of whatever it is. So tell me a little bit about that and how that's impacted you. Yeah, sure. It's uh, having a greater understanding of just how interconnected, you know, mm. we were created. Um, so, yeah, there's the the physical uh, exhaustion, which in today's crazy world, we were talking about technology a little bit ago. Just We're just busy mm. and we're supposed to be more productive. Uh, we're just on that, that rabbit wheel, uh, so to speak. So everybody, in essence, is tired. Um, kind of the the silver lining of COVID. There was a lot of money put into uh, some neurological research, like folks that have experienced, say, long COVID. Those, the brain fog, the the flu-like symptoms, you know, thankfully for those folks, those symptoms um, subside after a few months, you know, might have been, you know, 20 years in the making. So um, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, but it was kind of an interesting perspective. Folks that walked in those shoes for a short period of time were like, wow, this is what you deal with. And so that's the silver lining of, of like you said, um, you know, with some of these chronic illnesses, that parlays into the, the mental aspect. Uh, I've never clinically been diagnosed with, say, anxiety, but now helping lead an anxiety and depression uh, group and facilitate at our campus, uh, just being more familiar with what some of those uh, terminology and symptoms, you know, whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed look like. Um, when you have that path of uncertainty, yeah, it's going to create some fear, anxiety that in turn turns into depression, um, embarrassment. I shared a, a little bit ago with you, um, you know, public speaking, you know, I've been in front of rooms of 500 people, no problem at all. But when you start to, to uncover neurological issues and, and the kind of brain zaps and, and kind of the stop or train of thought. You know, that can get a little embarrassing if you have a slip up on stage or in a meeting or talking with a client or, or even a friend or family member. Uh, it's Nobody likes to feel inadequate of sorts. So it's the interconnection of, of things uh, and just how they're all interrelated. Yeah, and it's, you know, when it comes to chronic illness, it's sometimes it's the predictability, right, of um, I just know today is going to be infinitely harder and it's not going to change, and that's predictable. And then there's the unpredictability sometimes where I don't know. I don't know if today is going to be a good day or if today is going to be a bad day. And if you have to wake up wondering, then that just sets the course for your mental health, right? Yep. So what have you, so what have you found? It, it, here you are, you find yourself in the middle of this and this is the way it is. So what have you found? What's been helpful? What have you run into that's really kind of helped you get your bearings, get your, you know, uh, and just to continue to um, really pay attention and just to start getting back into a place where you know it's just healthier for you? What's that path look like for you? I'd be lying if I said I'm, I'm there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, each day is a, a different battle, and but it's that journey of growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so things that I found helpful, um, I had to learn how to modify and redefine some of my uh, definitions of what feeling good looks like what being present looks like, what being successful in a professional atmosphere looks like, uh, what being present looks like. So it's not easy. Um, As someone who was always able to kind of push through until I couldn't push through. Uh, So it's finding those healthy boundaries of 
redefining, hey, what works, what possibly hasn't, what are things I'm in control of, what are things I'm not, um, are there guardrails that I can put in place or my support team. Um, as you mentioned, when you have those days, you don't know how you feel. So say if I'm supposed to serve and I'm supposed to be there in 10 minutes to help facilitate uh, a group or to be a door greeter or you know whatever that, that serving role looks like, and I have a flare up 10 minutes before, and I live to literally four minutes from, from our campus. And there are some Sundays where because of my timing of medication, other factors, it's not safe for me to drive. So I have the blessing of being able to watch online, but then that in turn creates a mental strife of I'm not able to be connected with my church community in person, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, because I think you know how it is. So many people want, they want the story to begin and then end where everything's together and I've got it all managed. And that's just not real. You know, the reality is you may have new challenges five years from now, you know. Guaranteed. Um, yeah. But the but the beauty is, is um, continue to step forward and, you know, continuing to, you know, lean into community. And, and, you know, I think it's being vulnerable, like you said at the very beginning, is, is hard for anybody. Yeah. Um, it's just a challenge, but to just continue to say, I'm, I'm going to show up, I'm going to give myself grace, which is hard because you, you, when you feel like you're letting people down or it, when it feels like you're a burden, which can be a lot of people's story. I just feel like a burden. I don't feel like I'm always asking for help, but then recognizing, you know, just being honest, you know, from my seat, I have some people with chronic illness in, in my life. Um, uh, a couple of that come to mind and they were always apologizing, but the, who they've become in the process and the way that they trust the Lord and the way that they see things and the way that they slow down and the way they've learned how to presence, be present. I always want to be around them. <laughs> and so by me helping them, I, I get to be around genuine people who really need him. And, and I never mind. You know, but it's just funny how when you're in that situation, you see that differently. You know, I think that's one of the the tactics of the enemy is um, trying to, to seed out those false lies. Mm -hmm. um, that reminded me uh, that one of the things that I had to uh, still work through, uh, but it's that essentially a grieving process of my expectations of what was or my expectations of what could be mm -hmm. or what I think expectations of what should be but it's that reminder of hey don't listen to the lies some days are going to be better than others but just keep putting one foot in front of the other and uh, just you know just pouring into others and just being present because uh, that grieving process it, I found myself in a period of isolation um, out of not wanting to disappoint people not wanting to disappoint you know, those that were closest to me. But again, that was one of the words I had to redefine. Well, what's disappointment look like? In my mind, I envision something where my wife or children have a totally different viewpoint. So sometimes when you're battling, um, you know, mental health awareness like that, you know, we can take on too much or our perspectives really do get skewed um, because of that outside appearance. Yeah, well, that's good, man. So here you are right in the middle of your story and, um, and you lead a group and you help other people, which is by the way, awesome. Uh, and you're helping other people on the same journey that you've been on. So when they come to you and they just need encouragement, what do you tell them? My first goal is to kind of one of the spiritual gifts in this journey is listen to understand instead of listening to respond. Hmm. Sometimes it's a person's tonality. Um, it's not so much the words they speak, it's how they say it, that they could silently be reaching out for help. But the biggest thing that we try to um, promote as a team out there, we got an awesome team of facilitators, but it's we've survived 100% of our toughest days. And just to keep plugging along and that we hear you, we truly see you and we are empathetic and it's that deeper relationship, you know, with the Lord 
Uh, I can just speak from my personal experience uh, only because I don't want to place that on the others if they're in a different time and place in their walk, a uh, spiritual walk with the Lord. But I just know that's that deepening dependence, uh, getting rid of myself and just truly relying on him. My strength, when it's gone, he never falters. Mm. He's helped pick me up and carry me through uh, those darkest, darkest times. It's really good, man. It's really good. Well, I, I just appreciate you being vulnerable. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate you leaning in. And I know that you're, you know, one of the gifts, not just for you, but through you is not only are you a gift to Bullock County, but I know that they're a gift to you as well. Appreciate the Campus is just so important to be a part of community and to not do it alone. And so, and to give yourself grace. And so I just, I'm thankful for where you are and thankful for you being honest and sharing your journey. I think it's helpful. Appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it.